Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and dear subscribers. Welcome you all for the Friday webinar uh, with yet another interesting topic and the guest. Today's topic is understanding market trend, the abacus way. I'm sure with the, the title itself, everyone would have a uh, guest as to where from the uh, guest would come. Uh, the today's guest, Mr. Devan Songai from Avakas, is the senior fund manager. Uh, welcome, Devan. Good evening, Omar. Thanks, thanks, Devan. Before I hand it over to you, uh, I'll just give a brief uh, profile update to our audience about you. And I will also uh, take a few minutes to set the agenda also. Firstly, uh, Mr. Devan Sangai is the senior fund manager at Abacus, offers more than uh, two decades of experience on the asset management side. He has spent 10 years in the mutual fund industry and 12 years in the insurance space. Prior to this assignment, he was a CIO of uh, Canberra HSBC ONS, ONC Life, handling a corpus of USD 4 billion, roughly around 25,000 gross plus, of both equity and debt funds put together. His earlier experiences was with Aditya Birla Sun Life Insurance Limited, Aditya Birla Sun Life Asset Management Company Limited, ICIC Prudential Asset Management Company, and Canada HSBC OBC Life Insurance. Uh, Mr. Devan is graduated in electronics engineering from Mumbai University and holds a postgraduate uh, degree in finance from Newport University, California. That's the brief profile update uh, about uh, Devan. So today, before I hand it over to Devan, uh, let me just take a few minutes uh, to elaborate you about the topic for today. So in fact, uh, we are in the middle of uh, 2022 and there is a, an ambiguity on, on the investor's mindset as to what's going to happen in the remaining part of the year and beyond it. While the statement from many resources say that most of the damage is done and there is a little room for more deeper correction, it still indicators like the interest rates, inflation, and corporate earnings are the ones that could help us to arrive at a clarity going forward. And also the fact that the emerging markets, including India, has a ripple effect on the growing fears of recession in US. And in fact, which is also supported by the MSAI index data that is followed by around 17 percentage uh, you know, in, the, in the current year, which is the worst fall since 1998. And a recent new article says that according to Morgan Stanley, though a developed market recession would undoubtedly weigh on Asia's growth outlook, the downturn could be relatively shallow for Asia. This is on the global uh, news pieces. Back home in India, the trend of foreign investors is just looking reversed, that every day they are becoming net sellers and our DIAs are becoming net buyers, actually. So let us also understand you know, all these uh, news happenings around us from Mr. Devan. I think the next... Uh, 30 to 45 minutes would, would be very, very interesting to hear it out from Mr. Devan, actually. So without uh, taking much time, let me hand over the podium to Devan. Thank you, Uma. Thanks for the introduction. And thanks for giving opportunity to Abacus to have this session. So I'll just share uh, my presentation. So I'll just start with the presentation. Uh, so what is the current market situation? You know, last two years, uh, we had a dream run in the market. And I think this is the best of the run. I have seen it from 92 onwards, where uh, anybody who has been in equity market has made money. And that was a more of an asset quality call, uh, that you are in the right asset at the right time. And you, so it was a wonderful time. And... Uh, what we have seen post that, that the broader market, uh, as you started 
current year, calendar year, there has been a significant volatility and the concerns started coming on the market. From top, we had seen a significant correction in Nifty, not only in Nifty, but across the board, uh, there were uh, concerns uh, about uh, the markets and global markets corrected uh, significantly. And whatever hype and euphoria you had seen for the last two years got converted into more of a fear and concerns and the apprehension that inflation, interest rate will actually become much more going forward and you will see further steep cut as the central banker remove the liquidity from the system which was infused during the COVID crisis and with that everybody's eyes went on Fed, Fed to you know how much rate hikes will come, how fast they will come, how long they will continue and this concern of inflation, India reacted very positively. I think we have seen a lot of steps like we have seen excise and custom duties on crude and crude products been cut. We have put ban on export for wheat, sugar, and trying to do as far as possible every way the government wanted to be after, you know, reducing the inflation and, you know, trying to contain it. Uh, on the other side, uh, we have seen a lot of fear of recession, stagflation. But as we've seen that uh, these fears are on top of uh, everybody's mind, and we have seen some signs of easing of that inflationary fears uh, as the tightening has led to slower growth. What has happened during the last one year and if you see uh, last one uh, you know last three months india continues to be one of the best performing market for the one year and one of the better performing market uh, in the entire last three months and most importantly you've seen uh, you know nasdaq almost going down pre uh, covid level uh, there were a lot of uh, companies which were in limelight like Zoom, Robinhood, which have declined between 70 to 90 percent and the fine itself had declined more than 30 percent. So there was a lot of gloom and doom on the Nasdaq and uh, we have seen even global markets corrected equally sharply with this concerns. But if you look at MSCI emerging market, again that declined 19 percent in US dollar terms, India continues to be the one with only 7%. So India is doing relatively much better than the other emerging market, much better than the uh, developed market. What we have seen uh, during the COVID, again, uh, we have seen a very sharp, uh, you know, in the up cycle, mid caps and the broader market have done much better than Nifty. Uh, similarly, in this downturn, we have seen that small and mid caps have corrected more than the broad, uh, you know, Nifty, which are the larger indices. On the inflation front, what we have seen is that uh, the inflations had gone up in India. WPI had gone up more than the CPI. U.S. inflation print reach almost close to 9%. The last print has been a little softer to 8.5. And with higher inflation, what we have seen is a sell-off in the bond market, which resulted in both India and US or global bond yields going up. So what were the concerns? The concerns started with inflation, then the geopolitical risk, so Ukraine-Russia war resulted in, again, a lot of negative news increase in oil prices. But today, if you see for last couple of months, though the war is going on, there is no hue and cry. The media does not cover on uh, front page. And 
though so large large part of negative news is getting discounted higher oil price were concerned people were think, talking about predictions of 150 dollars of crude price somebody was talking about 200 dollars of crude price uh, our view is that with tightening with slow down in global economy crude cannot sustain and crude has already corrected from highs of 120s to now mid 90s so that's one the second is the commodity prices which were you know really gone into parabolic rise and they will continue to rise after they been up between 2 to 4 times from the bottom and with the global economic growth we have seen that also coming down rising interest rate we have seen yield spike inflation going up resulting in very steep hike the faster hike but as inflation started cooling off uh, from the peak it's still significant not significantly down but at least the expectations as these commodity prices fall and the crude fall and the global economic growth slows down we also see that now uh, there is a, a sort of a uh, benign inflation or rate hikes or uh, at peak you has had a gas price which was almost 6 dollars now it has come down last week to 4 and a half dollars per gallon and then the fif selling we have seen record fif selling almost close to gsc times and despite of them when gsc happened we have seen that uh, uh the market collapsed by 40% with similar selling this time we were down 17 to 18% and the large part of the selling was completely absorbed by the domestic flows which have been very very uh, strong throughout this volatility coming to indian rupee depreciation india rupee depreciation is not out of sync india continues to be one of the best currency performing currency in fact there are peers of india which have depreciated almost more than 30 to 50% uh, than indian rupee so indian rupee was much more stronger and i think rbi let it go rupee depreciation of 5 to 6% a year is not too much uh, to worry about and we continues to see a very relatively weaker rupee that's the policy which supports the exporters and that's the reason rbi let it go also so there is no run on currency unlike we have we have seen in sri lanka or pakistan or some of the emerging market we continue to be having a very very strong fundament coming to the commodity we have seen right from coal crude cotton raw sugar everywhere though they were gone up significantly but they have started cooling off wheat prices which went up significantly post ukraine war also have corrected steel prices with the export ban and slow down in global growth also have corrected and copper price which is supposed to be uh, you know leading indicator of global uh, you know industrial growth oh, that also have corrected very significantly from the top so if you see today india is relatively very very well placed post opening up we have seen very good demand environment and very strong revenue outlook from the industry do they have been margin pressure selectively on few industries but overall with the current uh, ka, you know season what we have seen is that there has been a upside surprise wherever we expected lot of margin pressures but they have not been significant negative uh, uh, very few companies uh, have reported numbers significantly below the expectation so india continues to be the fastest growing economy 
the government revenue collection whether you say income tax you say gst collection they are running all time high market is now uh, trading at reasonable valuation and the resilience what we have shown right from the investor to the economy shows that india is into a different leaf and it's a different country relative to the global growth also india is not a de domestically dependent economy not so much of export but exports are also showing very good strength as lot of factors are positively impacting like china plus 1 uh, india getting market share and indian entrepreneurs all hard work over years is getting reflected in in good export performance so india becomes a very notable manufacturing base what we have done in fact if you see now in this slide india has become the fifth largest market cap company in fact this rupee depreciation has reduced the gap but it continues to be one which has done significantly better and nobody can overlook india because the market cap because of the fastest growth and if you look at market cap to gdp again it's not very significantly higher than the peers domestic demand as i mentioned if you look at the gst collection if you look at the tax collection if you look at the manufacturing pmi if you look at the iip growth if you look at the uh, cv sales it's all showing good revival and good buoyancy indian overall macroeconomic wise is very fairly placed and very strong balance sheet to support the growth uh current account also is in reasonable shape though we have lost some of the forex uh, reserves but we still are more than 10 months of import cover which is very strong the us uh, d india inr again the depreciation is in line it's not and the other important factor is that our it exports are all time high and higher than our current deficit so so basically our current account is very strong and we also have now very strong fdi flows the fdi flows are almost 83 billion dollars a year on the surprise side of what we have seen in the economy we have a consumption driven economy we had good manufacturing led exports and besides it exports beside a uh, chemical export now manufacturing exports are picking up and the last not but the least most important part is rural rural economy has done significantly better over last two or three months and we have seen a very strong recovery happening partially because of the good monsoon partially because of government expenditure and partially because of relatively high uh, agri prices we have seen cotton price being high we have seen reasonable increase in wheat prices and the policies on ethanol front has given philip to sugar belt both sugar and ethanol economies are doing exceedingly well so net net rural economy is in very strong shape and it's recovering pretty fast manufacturing side uh, we have seen host of initiatives from government which is giving philip to manufacturing one is make in india then we had pli scheme corporate rate tax cut which had made india competitive in terms of the overall asian economy and uh, overall focus on increasing the logistic or availability of uh, infrastructure for sustaining manufacturing and manufacturing led export which makes india very strong and replacement ground for against the china against lot of indian uh, asian economies as a destination and that's one of the reason we have seen strong fdi coming in the country and almost 83 billion dollars of fdi has come which is again lifetime high for us on the markets uh, what we have seen after collection nifty is trading below the average of 10 years the despite what we have seen repo right hike we have seen roe is improve price to book 
also coming to a median of 10 years. So the valuations have, have become reasonable and uh, likely, uh, uh, you know, see more upside on Nifty as we flow. So the FDI flows, which I mentioned, this is again a second year of more than $80, $80 billion of FDI. FIFs who have been seller throughout, uh, right from the calendar year beginning, but that's been replaced by a very strong domestic flows. We have almost a monthly SIP crossing between 12 to 14,000 sustaining, despite our market going up or down, there has been a, a huge saving which is getting channelized. So India with almost becoming a $3 trillion economy, with 50, a uh, 25% saving rate, which is 75 billion, 750 billion dollars, and out of that, 10% comes to equity. There is a potential of 75 billion dollar kind of it, money which flows to equity, and that's again a very strong. We are seeing more and more uh, equity ownership from Indian. The acceptance of SIP, acceptance of equity as an asset class is getting really reflected in the flows what we are seeing and it has potential to grow from here. On the corporate earnings side, we have seen uh, sustained recovery on the earnings as we come out of the COVID. And this, if you see, despite of the pressure uh, there has been of commodity on few sectors, there have been a partial downgrade, but yet co corporate profitability as a percentage of GDP is likely to go up and nifty earning growth will sustain on the positive side. In the current quarter, what we have seen again, nifty sales growth of 29%, PBT growth of 15% this, and uh, PAD growth of 12%. Despite uh, of the commodity pressures of few nifty companies have faced, uh, Overall, corporate earnings continues to be very, very strong. There are uh, segments like BFSI, uh, engineering, and the uh, host of bottom-up uh, auto ancillaries, autos have done significantly better numbers. And we've seen that overall, uh, there are pressures on margin for uh, commodity impacted sectors. Also, IT, there has been some pressure on the margins. But overall, the earnings season has been not full, uh, full of positive surprises. And the expected pressure on margin did not come out to be bad as compared to what expectations were. So companies have managed costs much better despite of the pressures. And we see as the commodity costs start moderating, the second half of the year, you will see again the rebound in earnings for a lot of companies. Uh, this chart shows the negative return uh, of the Nifty. If you see the early 2000 or the 90s decade, we had five years of negative return on Nifty. In 2000 to 2010 cycle, we had only four negative returns. And which included a subprime crisis and a dot com. But if you look at this decade uh, from 2011 to 2021, 22, the largely there are only three negative cycles. And out of that, most of the fall has come from global crisis. So today, if you see, despite of uh, the, the negative return cycles also are reducing. Domestic flows are becoming stronger. Equity culture is becoming stronger in India. And India emergence in the world is not only for resilience, manufacturing, good quality corporate governance companies. So India is standing out in every way. Good political stability, good leadership, good sustained policy uh, environment, which is very conducive to do business and investment. So coming to about this portfolio positioning. So there's no major shift in our portfolio stance for the last six months. 
we remain focused on fundamental we continue to be positive on it digital rural financials and semi urban focused discretionary consumption in short term uh, the performance of sector like consumer automobiles and capital goods have been very strong uh, we have seen renewed in interest rate but the higher valuation for the growth uh, is beyond our comfort level uh, stock prices across the board have corrected and in uh, including our portfolio companies so our profit growth continues to be pretty strong in our portfolio our average roe is of our portfolio is about 20% uh, debt to equity is 0.1% and the pe is for the growth what we have between portfolio growth is between 14 to 16% is less than 11 to 12 so we are confident of a steeper bounce back on our portfolio companies we expect to be we are positive on india we are positive on the market we think time for india has come not only and it has been reflected by the higher confidence by domestic investor higher confidence from the long term uh, foreign investor by way of fdi political stability and sustained focus on growth uh, policy environment been stable and progressive gives a lot of confidence for india on future years and the growth journey of india to sustain 7 to 8% gdp growth it's pretty pretty strong coming to uh, our investment philosophy of abacus uh, so we are a patient uh, investor we do buy and hold we are bottom up idea generators uh, we have a team of eight analysts and 4 pm so 12 people working cohesively to generate ideas bottom up we are totally fundamental driven and in house research is our focus a large part of our idea generation almost one third of our idea generates out of our internal research and we we are we back our research with our portfolio allocation so almost 25 to 30% of our portfolio is backed by our in house research we don't mind being the first institutional investor in such companies uh, overall we are buy and hold investors we don't churn our churn of the portfolio is only 30% and we normally look at uh, a portfolio companies to mature in terms of giving returns between 3 to 4 years this is a means framework what we follow so it focuses on management quality management ability to allocate capital ability to scale as i mentioned earlier we focus on quality of earnings we do a complete deep dive on earnings balance sheet and we look at uh we we are basically we look at uh, large structural opportunities with competitive modes on the structuring side we don't try to time the market whenever we get the right price uh, we will start investing and wait patiently for our companies to deliver and unfold so that's our meet framework uh, why us we have uh, more than 200 years of experience we have established track record of more than two decades by sunil himself in uh, managing money uh, we have been positioned as a alpha focus player we do pick up good large winners and we have done consistently delivered across cycles so we have almost four this is four years we have gone through two cycles of covid and pre covid and post covid all three uh, cycles we have done very very well so that concludes my presentation i will be more than happy to answer any of the questions thanks thanks even uh, thanks for taking us the presentation uh, quite elaborately yeah and, uh, it was easily understandable to the audience so 
Um, now uh, the floor is open for Q and A uh, participants. You can. Uh, there are some questions come on the Q and A box, and in the meanwhile, uh, we have a set of questions uh, uh, from our side of research. So I'll just uh, you know uh, while the questions from the Q and A box are you know flowing, I'll in the meanwhile I'll just ask a few questions from sure. our research table. Is that fine, Devan? Sure, sure. You can ask the question. I'll say uh, it'll be very easy. I want the yeah, the, the first question, you know, from our side is that, uh, see, now India is in a better position uh, to absorb the global shocks um, at the beginning of uh, rupee against the dollar and rising uh, fuel prices are still a concern, right? So how do you think that India will tackle this problem? I think this question is also come on the Q&A box of the audience. Probably I think it would answer for all. Please go ahead. Oh. One thing uh, you have to say that from the rupee side, I did cover in my presentation. I don't think so. We are uh, significantly depreciated. If you see the uh, history of rupee has been depreciating at 5 to 6% every year. So if you look at currently, uh, you look at Turkey, you look at Pakistan, you look at Sri Lanka, some of the emerging currencies have de depreciated between 30 to 50%. Even a euro depreciation again dollar is higher than rupee depreciation against dollar. So we are relatively much, much better placed. Uh, coming to the oil price, oil price does impact, but this is a globally uh, impacting. It impacts everyone. It's not a single country which is not having an impact. The difference what we have to see is that when the oil price went to say $20 or $30, you know, in India, the petrol diesel prices were kept at higher rate and government consumed the large part of the revenue which came in. Uh, so we never had seen the oil price or a petrol diesel price dipping to lows what we have seen globally. From For a global inflation point of view for other countries, the Inflation is much, much higher for them because it's a very sharp jump for them. For us, it is relatively small. But as we move forward, already we have seen number of actions being done. Petrol, diesel, excess duty has been cut. So the prices are down. Also, crude was 122. It has come down to 96. So you'll see. So at between 80 to 90 dollars, we don't see petrol, diesel price being a big concern. Thanks, thanks, uh, Devan. Uh, let me pick up a couple of questions from the audience in the Q&A box. Uh, so there is one interesting question uh, on uh, India's valuations. So Mr. Anil is asking, uh, when you say India is trading at reasonable valuations, what is the basis? <laughs> he wants us to quantify the context. So, so if you look at, uh, uh, I, I'll tell you very simply, India was always trading expensive to the other markets. And there are several reasons to it. Because if you look at India, first of all, it's a much more diverse market. You have commodities play, you have consumption play, you have financial play, you have export play. You have host of everything. If you look at other countries, they have some are commodity driven, Russia, Brazil. If you, if you look at something like uh, other markets, there is a mixture of both. You don't get diversity. And some of the commodity plays always look cheaper. Second, if you look at the corporate governance issues, okay, India never have, India has a, one of the best corporate governance practices. It's much more freer. We have a very tight regulator. We have very good disclosures. We have world-class companies, right? From a banking to commodity to whichever sector you know, we have best, you know, IT. Then you, you look at uh, metals. They are globally competitive companies. Third is that if you look at other countries, and I think the most famous example comes is China. We don't have a policy flip-flops like China. Suddenly overnight, the foreign investors will who have edu put in an education sector big money, the policy change happens. Despite of whatever volatility, we have never stopped FIS to sell, stop selling. We have restrictions in FIS to sell in China. So the question is that today. During all these years, if you look at the ROEs of Indian companies, uh, corporate sectors, 
if you look at the growth, if you look at the corporate governance, all of them, if you compare that, then the India premium is justified and it has always remained. If I look at the last 10 year average, we have around the 10 year average. So we are not expensive or neither we are in bubble. So there are pockets of bubble in the market, but overall, the market's not in bubble. Okay, okay. Thanks, thanks, Evan. I think I'm sure that they would have answered the uh, participants' question. Um, the next question is again, uh, you know, on the overall market sentiment. So, uh, the question from Mr. Bavesh Varliani, he asked that uh, the slide on uh, the uh, third slide on the, the last uh, three decades return, the upside returns in the last decade looks less versus the earlier two decades. So, the second part of the question is that uh, given that equity is becoming popular, as you mentioned, would not the equity risk premium of Indian market will decrease versus the past? So, what we uh, the risk premium is a function of also interest rate. We have been uh, going down the interest rate. Also, if you look at uh, the long term returns, you know, if you see pre COVID, the returns were very, very compressed. We've gone through almost uh, three or four tsunamis or a very big changes. One was starting with a demand. Then you had NBFC crisis. Then you had GST. And post that, COVID came in. So you had one after another very big, big blows. And the COVID was the last blow. Uh, to go through huge changes and operating environment, we have seen that returns were compressed even before the COVID came in and COVID was a final blow. If you exclude that, then the Indian capital market compounded or the markets have compounded between 13 to 14% on a long term level. And this is what you will get over a long term. We have seen very compressed return, corporate profitability shrinking, and then post COVID, again, the corporate profitability came back very strongly. I hope I've answered that question. Yeah, yeah, clear, clear, uh, clear the one. Um, so, uh, next question uh, from Mr. Pawan Torani. Okay, uh, it, it asks, he asked that uh, which sub segments within the chemical space looks interesting to you? Uh, within specialty chemicals, do you see valuations being stretched for some of the well covered sell side names uh, are now trading at the expensive valuation? So, I think. Uh, uh, we do bottom-up research and uh, in chemical sectors with consistent growth, now valuations have gone for most of the good business. The valuations are in north of 30p or 35p and market is expecting that they will continue to deliver 25-30% growth without uh, any hiccups. And we've seen current quarters also, they've been significant margin pressures which have come in the sector. Uh, we need to be very much bottom up. It's again a very technical sector, which uh, is, so we, our understanding, we don't have any significant exposure. We have few exposures, but where we have the valuation is on our side and the growth delivery is also on us. But we are concerned with few of large part of the sector, which is trading at very high volume. Okay, fine, fine. Um, the next question is uh, on the China Taiwan, uh, but I don't want to directly ask that question to you, Devan. I would like to combine it with another aspect uh, to say that see the now the Indian market is uh, you know trying to maintain a strong financial infrastructure and establish the economy you know with uh, various new measures uh, on the uh, financial space. Uh, you know, but we would like to know how. Uh, no, resilient is our market to the external geopolitical tensions like uh, the Taiwan, uh, the China and Taiwan issue and all. Uh, your views on that? So we have seen multiple, uh, you know, tensions. So, you know, we have seen China, Taiwan. We have seen now Ukraine, Russia. The question is that how does it impact? And, and, and most importantly, in past also, we have seen every now and then India, Pakistan. You know, something happens on Kargil. Their geopolitical tension. Correct. So, first of all, we have to understand 
that india is no longer a small country or a third world country which our perception is india is 3 trillion dollar economy which is the fifth largest uh, economy in the world third largest after us and china in purchasing power parity and it is still growing at 7% so that's one so our second we have had multiple changes in the economy right from the way you handle covid so we have so i'll give you one simple example uh, during the covid there were a lot of subsidies given by the government with aadhar kind of framework we distributed all the subsidies within 30 minutes into everybody's bank account that's the kind of reform what we have done in us the subsidies have gone through mail order which took more than one month to reach so this is a tr- one transformation the um, n- number of general accounts what we have you look at the forex reserves it's 600 billion dollars you look at the fdi flows so there are lot of changes which have happened that doesn't mean the market will not volatile market will not fall fall but today if you look at our neighboring countries they are peanuts in front of us we have become a giant elephant which is galloping at 7% which has become significant in terms of world to ignore us so there is a vast changes which have happened in this country the time of this country has come it is very difficult for china to grow beyond 4 5% while we can do between 7 to 10 depending on how but 7% growth is a hindu rate of growth now so so fine uh, so i'll take a couple of questions on our uh, you know portfolio couple of questions coming on the portfolio as well so uh, you know the, they would like to know that uh, um many of abacus uh, investment is in small cap companies uh, how good is your portfolio to withstand uh, shocks when markets are choppy and volatile as compared to say a large and uh, mid cap fund this is question is from mr jitendra jain so f- by virtue the small and mid caps are having a higher volatility than large caps so one thing is the price volatility with the market which will always be there so that we cannot wish away being in the market second if you look at i, I did mention uh, that we have uh, companies which are growing between 15 to 18% in our small and mid cap which have roes of 20% they are virtually non leverage so our net equity of our portfolio is 0.1 and the valuation on the portfolio aggregate basis is 12 13 times so you have 15 to 17% growth at 11 pe so we have ensured that our companies deliver if they deliver they cannot remain such well low so there is a time where with the market all the stocks do volatile but the valuation takes care of the support becomes a support to a stock and if growth come continuously comes then definitely there is going to be unwinding over a period of time of that business okay thanks i hope that would have answered jitendra jain's question uh two questions on sectors let me combine so the one question is that what, what sectors do you would what, do you would avoid and why and uh, which are the other sectors uh, you know that uh, you would be Uh, you know finding it comfortable to invest at the current valuations so basically we have seen uh, in this market there are low growth companies trading at very very high pe's so we we will avoid them uh we will not like to buy anything where for a 15% growth we end up paying 70 80 there are companies in the market where there are no profit models and they are they are trading at five times seven times sales we have seen carnage of such companies globally so we'll avoid that uh what we uh, are comfortable as i told you we will we are very value conscious buyer we are a growth investor but we like to pay 
not overpay for growth. So we will continue to buy companies at one PEG. We will like to buy companies which are growing, which have very good uh, uh, ROEs, very good balance sheet, very good scope at a reasonable valuation. Uh, currently, we do like uh, banking as a sector uh, where I think we've seen a, after three, four years, a very big turnaround. All the worst seems to be behind us. IT is another sector which is going through a consolidation phase, but I think we see a very good long upside for continuous growth happening for that sector. It has emerged out of uh, what you can say three, four years of hibernation post-COVID, and we see very strong growth happening there. And we, we look at uh, growth in various bottom-up ways. So it's not sector, but we look at wherever we find good growth, growth balance sheet, good potential at reasonable valuation, we are happy to buy. Okay. Um, so what question, what is the uh, growth value stock proportion uh, for your oil cap and the emerging opportunity strategy? So uh, most of most of our stocks are only growth. Okay. If there is no growth, we would like to avoid such stocks. So we, we like to buy some growth or the other. So we will have large part of our portfolio at growth. Some there are turnarounds, so which might take time, but that would be less than 5% of our portfolio. Okay. Does uh, the small gap exposure in, uh, in both the funds, you know, which are slightly significant, uh, does uh, leave the way of... Uh, Excessive churning in the portfolio? I did mention in my uh, uh, presentation that our churn ratio is only 30%. We are normally buying old investors. We buy the stock and for stock and the business to unfold in terms of growth and the valuation takes around three to four years. That's our normal holding period. Okay, okay. So uh, we'll also have to take uh, this question on the uh, you know uh, RBA uh, policy. So with the rising inflation and global supply chain disruptions, uh, what according to you will be the response of RBA you know in terms of the monetary policy, and uh, what's your projection for upcoming rate hikes? And so I mean, what? Uh, yeah, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah I'm. Uh, so we have almost, almost uh, seen that uh, RBI has been continuously hiking rates. Uh, we also have seen moderation in the liquidity happening. So there has been major taken to moderate uh, liquidity or, you know, suck the liquidity out of system. Uh, they are in tune with everybody. But if you look at Indian inflation has been not very high as compared to US. Also, we have to see that... Uh, uh, we are also, whether there was inflation or non-inflation, we are going back from a uh, very easy monetary policy to sustain economic growth in COVID times to a normalization. And normalization also leads to some of these things happening. So whether we go to over-tightening, whether we go to hyperinflation phase, I don't think so. Looking at current status, we have seen sharp decline in commodities from the top and a softer crude as this policy globally go then we will see that inflation moderates out due to base effect due to correction in components like oil food prices definitely some of these things may not be as we go in the third or fourth quarter of this calendar year things may not look as bad as they are looking today. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Evan. Uh, so this question is on the IT. Uh, Mr. Pawan Taurani is asking, uh, are you cautious on the IT services companies with high exposure to Euro European region? Within the IT space, uh, where do you find uh, value now, uh, given valuations uh, are still stretched vis-a-vis uh, -vis the historic levels? So first of all, if you look at the uh, IT, each IT business is a different business. And we have to look at each business separately. Obviously, there are stresses in Europe. Uh, we have seen uh, this higher energy prices. Uh, also, Russia, Ukraine, war has impacted Europe more than the other uh, subcontinents. But when we have seen the higher recession, that's where the higher outsourcing happens. That's where people want to 
you know, cut costs and outsource more. That's where Indian IT comes in. The businesses which have sustained growth potential uh, will definitely have a higher valuation. Uh, so we'll have to look at uh, the business, what we get into uh, and whether the growth sustains. So today people have a question mark on growth, but if growth sustains, the valuation won't be expensive. There is a pressure on margin. That's why the top line growth is higher, but the uh, EPS growth is lower. But partially it is, you know, you are, you know, need to also look at that during COVID times, there were no travel. During COVID times, there were no visa cost. During COVID times, uh, people were working from home. So there are a lot of expenditures which moved out and they're coming back. And you have a higher salary cost. Or oh, Also, you have created large bench for execution. I haven't seen in last one decade that each of the larger IT companies hiring one lakh. So it shows the visibility of growth, visibility of business. Okay. Fine. So let me take another question uh, from Mr. Prashant uh, Bhatil. So he would like to know uh, whether we would like whether one has to go uh, overweight on middle and small cap at the, at the current point in time, or should he uh, should he should someone have to hold for some more time? That's the first part of his question. And second part of the question is that uh, between the you know schemes uh, of PMS and AIF, what is the exposure or overlapping between the small and mid cap names in a virus? Okay. So basically, uh, on the mid and small, as I mentioned, that we have seen a very sharp correction in mid and small. Uh, we had stopped taking money in November when we saw a euphoria in mid and small caps. We have opened for subscription for the PMS for mid and small cap. That's one. Second, uh, I also mentioned that Indian corporate sector have gone through four tsunamis, which at least except for COVID, three other one were not there in any, any country. So there was no demonetization. There was no NBFC and banking crisis. And there was no GST implementation, which resulted in a lot of companies, you know, getting out of business and a huge consolidation. On top of that, you had a COVID. So whichever companies have survived through these four, four uh, tsunamis, are very strong in balance sheet, very strong in resilience to operate in any environment, and they are very strong to grow and take market share. We need to pick and choose businesses which have ability to execute this growth, get market share, and deliver growth, profitable growth. So as long as that is there, we see a very huge opportunity. And today the value, there has been a correction, a very sharp shift correction in mid and small caps. So any business which fits our mid criteria looks very good for next three to five years. Coming to our AIF and PMS, uh, definitely PMS keeps on getting money at different point in time. So our portfolio for both AIF and PMS should be, for mid and small cap, should be almost 30, 40% overlapped because AIF money gets comes in and gets invested, and then it's locked in for four years. A churn rates are very low. PMS we keep on getting money every day. Okay, okay. Thanks, thanks, Evan. Uh, can we take the two more questions, uh, Evan? Sure. Yeah. So uh, this question is very relevant, actually. You know, uh, in the current point in time, uh, which is a very basic understanding of a client, Mr. Sumit. So he would like to know that the monsoon and the demand suppressing due to interest rates is currently happening uh, with the jobless rate increase, actually. How, how do we expect that the earnings of the companies will be maintained? Because as long as the earnings are in intact, the stock prices will also continue doing that. So his concern is on the earnings part. So earnings, I, I did mention that we have a very good season. And... Uh, a lot of companies which were facing margin pressure due to commodity price hikes. Uh, we have seen that the commodity softening will get reflected in the second half, either partially on third quarter and fourth quarter. So you're going to see revival. Second, very good monsoon also results in a very good farm income or very good buoyancy in economy. So 
the festive season what we are going to see this year the post diwali i think there will be a first diwali there is no covid the last diwali also there was some part there was covid round 2 round 3 so this year you going to have very strong income very strong farm income very good buoyancy so we see sustained buoyancy and and uh, as uh, some of you also mentioned that there is no chance of recession in asia india continues to be the one country which is showing no sign of recession in fact we will have a slower growth but we still have a 7% gdp growth uh we expect seven, second half to be much much better than what we have seen in first half okay i think that uh, that's a very important thing which gives up a, a clear clarity to the audience in the current point in time so i have got a couple of questions which i will just uh, sum it up as one question and uh, you know bring in front of you so one is basically uh, you know from from the, the current point in time investing in bms uh, through a staggered manner uh, would it make sense and uh, you know with all this uh, you know earnings uh, being all discussed now uh, you know in the, in the going forward in the current scenario whether it would make uh, whether it would be prudent to invest money at one time or you know doing it through stp uh, and uh, what does your take on large caps as well so basically see timing is a we don't understand to time market we feel that uh, the valuations have corrected all the large part of concerns are priced in uh we have seen very strong uh, rebound in in the market and the earning season has been very strong so we will we don't know how to time the market if you are concerned about global the most of the concerns on the markets are global and and you have to see one important thing uh, which is quite different all along you had a US inflation was 2% India was between 6 to 8% today for a 6 to 8% normalized inflation Indian GSEC is 7.5% around 7% US which had a 2% 3% inflation which is now close to 8 and a half which might normalize between 4 and 6 their GSEC rate is still 3.25 so which is a country which is running very high negative interest rates it's not india it's us so people have to be more concerned about developed market where the negative interest rates is much higher coming to uh, sorry i lost the so we we feel that today india or some of the asian countries have a completely different macro economic compared to what developed world is they are much strongerly paced uh, also asia is a commodity consumer some part of his exporters but but as the commodity prices fall especially for india when you see we are consumption driven economy we are not an export driven e- economy within the asia so our growth does not depend on global growth third as we see india is an alter creditable alternative to china in every way so people want to come to us as a fdi investor because we see very strong economy growing economy and a sizable economy which they can't ignore second our export the way policies have come people are looking for a creditable alternative to china india stands out and india is not india has got engineering talent india has got a lot of positives as i mentioned manufacturing scale capability go global design so whichever way you see india is the country so we will go through upheaval but today as a country we are fairly much uh, more insulated than global growth issues does that mean our stock market will not behave and not correct it will go through correction but we have seen the rebound we are almost closer to the peak which was there in feb march i don't think so how many asian countries or how many global countries are back to the peak 
clear, clear the one, I think. So what, uh, this is my question. See, basically, um, the positivity of uh, the overall uh, you know, market uh, will also include the part, the new issuances, right, uh, with regard to the NFOs in the market, right? IPO, I would say. So probably, you know, uh, the recent ones, you know, the startups getting converted to uh, into an IPO, like the a couple of, uh, you know, names. I don't want to mention the names here. Uh, so are becoming a big time failure when they get uh, listed also. So where would you see, you know, the uh, IPOs uh, trend, uh, trending forward uh, in the future? I think uh, what we have to see at uh, that there are IPOs which are very heavily priced. And uh, not that uh, the quality of IPO is issue. Some of them are good quality or most of them are good quality, excluding the new age companies uh, where we don't understand the valuation or to buy. They are good businesses, but we don't know how to value. So any companies which have good track record and reasonable valuation that, I, that IPOs have done pretty well, I don't think so. People have lost money, but anywhere you have overpaid for the growth, which is what I'm trying to say that any anywhere the people have overpaid for growth, they have suffered. So it has been, we don't have to see the number of successful IPOs. We have to see the quality of IPO and the valuation at which they're coming. Okay. If the valuation is right, I think people have made money. Okay. So, uh, so, so you take this that going forward, the IPO market uh, with the decent valuations, uh, as well. I think we today have... also there is a decent demand. So there are IPOs going through. They are not in plenty. Mm. But if they come at the right valuation, IPOs are going through. I don't think so. There is an issue with uh, but the mad rush to buy at any price is no longer there. That's true. That's true. Fine, David. I think we have almost covered uh, most of the questions uh, uh, come from the participants and from our research table. Mm, so uh, uh, let me give a, a conclusion note to the participants. So the last uh, you know, 45 minutes of time from Mr. Devan Sangoy gave us much more clarity on uh, where the, the economy uh, would head you know, going forward in terms of a lot, lot of positive aspects. You know, we as a country, you know, uh, are having in our within ourselves. So one has to go also weightage to that. Yes, the near term. You know, markets ups and downs, volatility, it's part and parcel of the game. This has been the case for the last uh, 30 years time period, right? Even right. if you go to the, uh, the last before decade, things have been much more worse than what it is uh, happening now. So, but we have uh, gone past all that situations and we have sailed through successfully. Uh, similarly, uh, one uh, should have uh, that kind of a confidence in mind. And the last 45 minutes of inputs given by Mr. Devan Sangoy you know, on the Indian fundamentals vis-a-vis -vis the uh, global disturbances where India has not much affected, you know, all these gives a, a positivity of uh, our, uh, you know, fundamentals, which are very strong. So on which uh, the whole uh, economy and the corporate governance would uh, sail through. So, uh, so let us all hope for the best and uh, uh, hope you all found the last uh, uh, 45 minute session very, very useful and very informative. And uh, I'm sorry for a couple of participants, uh, we were not able to answer your questions being because of the reason that uh, there's been too many questions flowing in the you know in our Q&A boxes. We would address all those questions one to one uh, in the uh, you know uh, after getting a reply uh, wherever eleven from Mr. Devon as well. So um, thanks, thanks for all your participation, and uh, thanks Devon Sangai for you and your team for giving us and for spending your time uh, to address our so subscribers on our Friday webinar. Thank you, Uma, for giving the opportunity to us. And I wish happy Independence Day. I think we are marking a 75th anniversary. And I think it's a very big milestone uh, in times ahead. The growth story of India and being to be a proud of proud Indian is again a uh, very, very uh, I would say enriching experience than what we have seen in the last two decades. Have yeah. a nice weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think you gave a nice note to that uh, you know we are earmarking the uh, the session today of understanding the market trends by Abacus to the 75th Indian independence. I would say. <laughs> so yeah. uh, I would say, say rather that also uh, last 75 years of uh, tough times that we have sailed through. 
uh, from the scratch, you know, to this level actually now, uh, in terms of the GDP growth. So hopefully, uh, we will look forward to the same kind of, uh, you know, uh, achievement going forward. Uh, with that positive note, uh, let me conclude today's session. And uh, we'll meet you next week with another interesting topic and interesting guest as well. Thank you all. Thanks.